Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lintamande. Thread 1, Mad Investor Chaos and the Woman of Asmodeus. Episode 52. Keltham tries to recollect what he can of the items in Ioni's list that seemed at all interesting, as now seen from a somewhat different standpoint. He can't recollect much of it, though. That visibly helps a lot under the new conditions. Spends some time figuring stuff out, spends more time trying to figure out if he can do any better, and then prays. He does receive his spells this time, though with no sense of his own god looking back. Keltham now has Zeroth Detect Magic Guidance What should be Detect Poison What should be Create Water Create Water seems like the most munchkinable thing that's a cantrip, which isn't very munchkinable. But at four gallons per caster circle, maybe he can do something with repeatedly suddenly sixteen gallons of water in an emergency situation. First, Truth Spell X3, Fairness X2, Sanctuary, Protection, Comprehend Languages. Second, Augury X3, Owl's Wisdom, Early Judgment. Taking the early judgment spell seems a little unsafe, like they'd only sell that magic in a shop of ill-advised consumer goods because it's too potentially addictive. But it also seems important to have around, at least for today, in case he needs to make a mental recovery. Third, used on two one STs, and a second, fourth, enchantment. Foil, what should be sending? That leaves him with some time left, while Carissa preps spells, which he'll first use to press to digitate his clothing clean over the sink in the ensuite bathroom, not that Keltham is remembering to be appreciative of this incredible luxury. Then Keltham attempts to think for a bit, his thoughts tentatively trying out a review of recent events, before he concludes that in fact, he shouldn't do that, and should try to decompress more instead, while he's alone by himself in the quiet, but for the sound of rain outside. He'll poke through the 14-volume history on Absalom, which becomes more interesting after it becomes clear that Absalom is where the Star Stone resides. The quality of the reasoning in the history books is something like six times better than those of the books in the Villa Library. More like one reasoning error per two sentences instead of three reasoning errors per one sentence. Is that because the palace can afford better books than... But why... why would... books... Information. You should just be able to reprint the best versions of things, if the information exists. Do more intelligent authors demand incredibly high book royalties, to the point where most people can't afford good information about basic subjects? Galerion. Why? The book's contents seem to be dated to before Aridan died, which, if Keltham is recalling correctly, was a century ago. Maybe that's at least how long it took for the slightly smarter and better-reasoned book to have its copyright decay to where it could sell enough copies to be worth printing. Galarian, again, why? Information is very easy to copy once it exists. Information on core topics is among the most blatant possible cases, where civilization has an interest in everybody being able to afford it. All the altruistic smart people are off being wizards at the world wound, maybe. Carissa knocks on his door an hour later. Enter. Carissa finds it encouraging how quickly he is warming up to this. She'll enter and kneel at his side over in the reading nook, if that's what he's doing. She has never done this before and feels faintly ridiculous, but what's important is whether Keltham is into it. Fell enter would actually be among the things you'd say in baseline if somebody knocked, and it wouldn't especially be a command. It's just that... It's okay by me if you want to come in would be more syllables than civilization would choose to encode into a query response pattern that gets used like over a billion times a day. And now Carissa is on her knees on the pillow beside the reading nook. Obviously no such custom exists in civilization, and kneeling itself wouldn't mean anything there. But it's clearly a standard thing, given the pillow beside the reading nook. He doesn't ask what this clearly standard thing standardly encodes, because part of him seems to feel that the meaning is somehow obvious. Not all of it. And maybe he's completely wrong. It just obviously seems like something that you wouldn't do, unless you are to him what Carissa is to him. So it means at least that. He reaches over and ruffles her hair, because that feels right. Hey, he says. Hey, 
I have reported to security and prepared my spells and been assigned a room, though yours is fancier. I think they like you better, probably because of how you're going to bring about the technological revolution and make the world a place Zon Kuthon won't consent to permitting to exist. Well, if your room isn't fancy at all, maybe I'll go complain. Your room being fancy and my room being fancier seems like a reasonable premise for a relationship like this one. Any updates from security on Ioni, Pilar, Asmodia, Gods, or timelines on Project Resume? Lean. Ioni's not awake yet. They threw some fancier healing at her in case that helps. This isn't very much of a bad sign, though. If it's still true this evening, it will be. Pilar's back. She ended up in Elysium, the chaotic good afterlife, for some reason. I didn't ask more questions, because that sort of thing can be personal, but I bet she'd tell you about it, if you ask. Asmodaya's not back yet. Pilar ended up elevated priority because they wanted to ask her questions about how she ended up in our mission out of the villa. But it sounds like she doesn't know any more than we do. Asmodia's going to require a seventh circle spell. Regenerate. Because of her legs, so she might be a week or so in wartime like this. I asked if I could help with the war effort, but was told to stay focused on this. I think they're ready to resume once you are. They could set up a room here for classes, but don't want to push you if you're not ready. Keltham is a bit startled that Carissa would just tell him that Pilar ended up in Elysium. That should have been something he had to figure out on his own by talking to Pilar, or investigating her, or something. Pilar should have been left more mysterious than that until their first date, or until he did something to appeal to her if those tropes were governing here. Call it maybe six times as likely on the theory, Chelish Governance asked Pilar, what, and found out a weird thing, and promptly and sensibly told Carissa so she could tell me, as on the theory, this is an arrow larp. With possible amendments, if the chaotic good thing turns out to be itself much more mysterious. But still, Keltham making the first discovery that starts the mystery trail should require that he start Pilar's route, like, at all. Or maybe that happened when she took a plus three vicious nasty big sword for him. But still a surprise. Not advance predicted, not the main thing the theory obviously says. You don't want to rationalize those out the window. Maybe call it three. One instead of six. One, though. Well, huh, Keltham says. The details there would be a bit hard to explain, but that's some small evidence against the reasoning system I was using to infer that one of the girls is a secret Zon Kuthon cleric, or that one of the more unusual girls in class will have the being-forced fetish. Not decisive or anything, but noticeable jolt. The key is knowing how to keep track of that sort of thing over time, which is what I'd otherwise have planned to lecture on next the law for accumulating pieces of evidence that aren't individually decisive until they add up to something. Asmodia's going to end up pretty behind in a week at the rate we were going. I'm not sure how much you can recover from that sort of thing by reading notes in a situation like this one. Well, maybe somebody else could teach Asmodia to help solidify the material in their own minds by teaching it. That's a big part of the reason why older kids teach younger ones in Doth Elon. Still, that'd be a big chunk of someone's time. Depending on how expensive a Seventh Circle Regenerate is. Well, except that they are going to do it at all, eventually, so we're not paying from zero. I probably want to expend some political capital on it happening earlier, if the project is considered competitive, with war demands at all. I could teach a class today, for sure, whether I should... Maybe not so much, if the view from above says that somebody in my position is supposed to take one day off. And it probably does. Telling Keltham about Pilar was a correct move in the second law game. Okay. Carissa doesn't understand why and would really like someone to read Keltham's thoughts and try to get more, but it's... information. And as Keltham says, you can use a little of that at a time. It might literally be cheaper to pass Asmodia a two-way mirror in hell so she can keep up, she says. But I think it's reasonable to press them on getting her back sooner. If they can do that? Neat. I've got no objection to that, if it's cheaper. Key thing is, Asmodia can ask questions from where she is and get them answered. Pass it to them next time you see them. Ahem. 
pass it to them the next time you see them, unless I tell you that I've passed it on first. Or is this not a giving orders occasion? One thing is for sure, he needs to not just ask Carissa what he's allowed to do. Brain registers a desire to scream internally. Approved. Why can't anyone legible in Galarian? Thank you, Brain, now shut up. If that was an error, it wasn't a critical error, and eventually things will be fine. Will do. Carissa would kill quite a large number of people to be able to read Keltham's mind right now. Is this obedience turning him on? Yes, it is, apparently. And furthermore, his mind feels blank if he tries to figure out what else to talk to her about, so. You're allowed to start pestering me for sex again, by the way, since it's now morning. No promises, of course, but you're allowed to try. Before yesterday turned out so eventful, I was planning to show you what I got from the fancy Ostenso sex shop, and maybe invite you to come with me sometime, but that's looking less likely now. Maybe they can bring a selection to us. Well, that sounds promising. What new outfits or toys have I unlocked after our latest relationship progress? I actually bought this outfit there. Should I tell you why they sell it at a sex shop? Not a normal tailor's, or would you rather experiment? Now that's the doth Ilani equivalent of asking a duke's son if he's too scared to go rhinoceros racing. Experimentation follows. The experiment is a success. More resources are allocated to following up on these discoveries. This scientific investigation might possibly be threatening to get a little out of control and investigate subject matters that could perhaps be regarded as dangerous without a verified sufficient level of safety precautions. Keltham accordingly restrains himself, but this is going to be pretty darn visible as a fact, if you have Carissa's sense motive opposing what passes for Keltham's bluff. Carissa's mostly playing by intuition, lately, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, but she's aware that most of the point of seducing people for strategic reasons is that you can get strategic concessions out of them when their judgment is compromised, and also that Dothilan would definitely know this and advise their kids against it. So. We'll see who is better at this. Cheliax or Doth Ilan. She pulls herself away, sits cross-legged, folds her hands, tries to look like she's trying hard not to say anything, like she's sad and not quite pretending otherwise, but certainly not trying to put it in his way. Keltham attempts to roll his sense cognitive background state, devises a guess. Uh, if I trust my ability to read you, you look like somebody with a problem she'd usually and normally hide, because that's what normal people in Golarian do in this situation, but you remembered that I asked you to err on the side of a lot more visibility, and now you're wobbling between that request and the reason why a normal person would usually hide that. I won't ask follow-up questions until I've either been told my current guess is wrong, or I've received some indication from you that you've reached your own estimate, using the information you have and I don't, that it is safe for me to inquire further. Done. Flaming shit. That was hard to phrase without asking her to make a decision instead of him. If this doesn't rapidly get easier with practice, Keltham is going to use his unilateral relationship decisions power to meta-decide that he gets to ask Carissa to decide things ever. I think maybe people would hide this in Dathilan too, actually. On the principle that, uh, it seems wildly more important than not pressuring people into sex. But your orders take precedence. I think. If I calculated that wrong, well, probably we will calculate lots of things wrong at first. I need an explicit statement of your guess, using the information you have that I don't. That it's okay for me to ask more questions. I have no idea what you're potentially protecting me from right now, or what costs there are to my knowing something that's supposed to be unknown to me, or even just illegible. It is fine for you to ask more questions. There's a very distinct ouch of realizing that he may have pressed her too hard just then, to be legible and not subtle, when on the meta level discussing safety. But she'll survive. She promised him that. Kay, what's wrong? You think that there's a substantial chance, not a large one, but one worth planning around, that I am actually lying to you about having reliable contraception and planning to, I guess, get pregnant and then run off before anyone notices to some country where I wouldn't be legally obliged to have an abortion. And 
I understand why the chance of that doesn't have to be very large to be very important to you, and I understand that you don't have much reason to trust me, though I and I think your God have been trying to give you some. And I understand that none of that matters. And you can have the stupidest reason in the world, and it's fine. It's your choice. You can have whatever you want from me, and it doesn't have to be... But it does make me sad. And I don't see why you'd believe that. It's not more information. But... But it does make me sad, is all. Now you have all the information that I have. And, uh, I remain very uncertain if you actually meant me not to hide things like that. It's fine if you didn't mean that kind of thing. Most people wouldn't mean that kind of thing. He'll gather her in to hug her. It is what I meant. Thank you for not just hiding the whole thing. I appreciate that part a lot, and I understand. It's my responsibility to not be unduly influenced by you being sad. Now that I've asked you not to hide what you'd usually hide, at least for a while. Snuggle. Okay, I'm not asking you to be influenced. Both Keltham deciding to fuck her and Keltham deciding to not care about her feelings are good outcomes here. This is usually where I would apply creativity. It's just, I have so little grasp of magic, and all the people I would otherwise ask might be, assuming the premise, in a conspiracy with you. Though Ioni might be less likely than some. But no. For purposes of deciding whether it's okay to risk having kids, he needs to assume that Ioni is scripted. By governance, not by some meta-level arrow larp. And can't be trusted either. I know what science maniac Veres would do in this situation. Namely, figure out how to use prestidigitation to impose a magnet field over his own sperm. The way that mature male contraception technology works in Dathilan. But, in real life, if you try that sort of thing... Well, no. Actually, I guess I could heal myself if I hurt myself. Unless I gave myself cancer. But that, I'd guess, just takes a more powerful cleric spell. And even if I literally kill myself, you could bring me back. But the problem is verifying that the sperm are actually dead, and that the silly clever trick worked, when I can't ask anybody here to help me figure out how to verify whether sperm are alive. But there was a spell. Detect life on Ioni's list, I'm pretty sure. And if I ask my god to give me that, I can see if it works on sperm, and then it goes through my god rather than anyone here. Or actually, potentially simpler solutions. Is there a fourth circle or lower spell I can ask my god to give me that would let me create a small object that isn't as fragile as prestidigitating that, and can have properties like impermeability to fluid adhesion to skin until dispelled. Keltham is now attempting to invent birth control via condoms from scratch. His first visualization is a small patch that fits over the tip of his urethra and will contain the liquid that emerges from it. Which is neither of the good outcomes. Why is Keltham like this? I feel like there are plenty of solutions if killing people is considered an acceptable cost and you should not do things that are at all likely to kill you. I don't actually know what would be a solution if killing people is an acceptable cost, though it sounds like it's not at all a great time to ask Chiliax to burn a resurrection on that. I mean, to be clear, under the circumstances, I might not be able to trust your solution, but I, I admit to being pretty curious about what else Galarian will trade a heap of dead bodies for. Keltham has entered problem-solving mode. Good work for having a problem, Carissa. Well, you could kill me, because pregnancies don't survive dying and being raised, and you could test that in advance on some other women who were pregnant and preferred not to be, if you didn't want to just trust it. Or you could kill me, and then, instead of a resurrection, do a plenar binding to bring me back from hell, because devils can't get pregnant. I don't know how you could verify that, but Asmodeus probably wouldn't bother with Cheliax if devils could just make more of themselves in hell. I am not very impressed with these solutions, but what happens to me if I die is much more definitely known and understood than what happens to you. So if we're using death-related contraceptive methods here... Remind me of what your usual contraception is like. I think you may have told me, but I forgot. Pregnancy also does not survive a polymorph to any form that can't itself sustain a pregnancy, and the cheapest polymorph that's sufficient is second-circle alter-self, 
so I go mail and back, every night when it's potentially relevant. Very easy to verify you doing, though the thought is more than slightly odd. But the trouble is, at the appropriate level of paranoia, I have only sources inside Cheliacs to tell me that Alter Self works for aborting pregnancy. If I ask my god for a spell to detect whether you're pregnant, do you know if I get one? I don't think a spell for that exists. You can't tell with detect intelligence until twelve weeks along. You could have some pregnant people in to alter self in front of you. Oof. That's a cost there, if it has to be twelve weeks along, meaning they couldn't just find somebody who didn't actually want a baby and pay them to participate in the experiment. Though maybe Cheliax has some wizards who only do the alter self thing after they detect or change their minds, and advertising for one of those would turn somebody up. It doesn't really solve the main problem, though, because he can't be sure that what works at twelve weeks works at one hour. If you alter self immediately after sex, then shift back, would I be able to check inside you and verify that the semen had vanished? Maybe I'd be willing to try for the further trust in that case. That semen doesn't persist in a vagina or uterus that you don't have. Actually, no. Shit. I can't rely on that, because you could also produce that result with prestidigitation, even if it wouldn't ordinarily happen from Alter Self. No, wait, counter to arguendo. If you can cast Alter Self and come back fast enough, I can have Detect Magic running the whole time, check your vaginal contents before and after, and verify that Alter Self was the only magic to affect you over that period. This is actually kind of fascinating, as compounding capabilities problems go. Maybe the Aerolarp is deconstructing a computer game where the player needed to drag the spells from a list of available spells to form the correct structure to eliminate a pregnancy before they could fuck anybody. That sounds like how a computer game version of an Aerolarp would work. Carissa has this job mostly because she is much less inclined than everyone else in Cheliax to throw up her hands at Keltham and go, My diagnosis is that he is an insane person. But she's sort of feeling that, right now. I am willing to do that if you'd like it. I think probably if we were secretly a Dread Empire, we'd just mind control you about this, though. I appreciate an update on the argument. Knowing as little as I do about mind control, or about how hypothetical bad Asmodeus might be concerned about my own god counter-escalating, it's not enough to decide the issue. Admittedly, if you carefully demonstrated mind control capabilities that can just completely, undetectably to me, make me believe or decide things, that would be a larger update than I've made so far about good Cheliac's intentions. There'd still be the possibility you were in a balance against my god, but it'd be an update. Does that process give me the result I need to observe? On your prediction? Detect magic? Check vagina? Alter self? De-alter? Check vagina? to verify that the process vanishes semen. Mind control can do that. I don't know spells like that myself, but I would expect high-ranking palace security do. What an incredibly convenient way to build trust, actually. Have a sufficiently high-level caster cast suggestion on him and then promise that it hasn't otherwise been done. Which it hasn't, because Asmodeus said not to, perhaps because it was worth it. And I think that process works. It's kind of complicated and tight, is the thing. For a poorly tested process, he isn't sure that he can detect whether or not a vagina contains semen in the first place. But then it's basically backup against an itself improbable conspiracy, not the primary means of birth control. One also needs to consider that, at a sufficient level of magical power and ill intent, they could have done something clever when he had sex with Carissa the previous day, quickly moving semen from her mouth to her vagina maybe as screened by an illusion. Heck, they could have teleported sperm right out of his epididymis while he was sleeping in the villa the first night, before the forbiddance went up, though they'd also have to mix it with seminal fluid to have a chance for the sperm to survive a uterus. Keltham lets out a sigh. No promises, but I'll think about it. And tell you tonight whether to prepare Alter Self tomorrow. Well, that's progress. And on some level, she can. Respect how careful Keltham is. Respect that while he does seem to care about her more than is healthy, he's not actually an idiot about it. Probably almost every chelish teenage boy would do worse. Well, better to keep pushing. Lightly. I prepare it every day. Hope springs eternal, and also we haven't actually talked about exclusivity yet. 
I will possibly maybe think about it faster then, but this is security reasoning and can't be a quick decision. And exclusivity, like monogamy things? I'm not quite sure what that has to do with intercourse. Well, see, I am expecting you to order me not to have sex with other people without your permission, but absent such orders, I might, you know, proposition someone who has an incredibly cool armored vest and then want to have my alter self for that. <laughs> Point to you for catching me out on that. I think my brain is assuming things that have not been discussed. If it wasn't just a more routine, false, closed-world assumption with respect to my ignorance of anybody else you wanted to have sex with, implying that I was the only such person. I feel strangely like... There's a part of me that wants that thing to be true of you, that you ask my permission, but I also feel reluctant to give you that order right this instant, and I'm going to have to do an introspection to figure out why. Incidentally, even if I can't trust it, is there anything way simpler and more standard that male Fourth Circle clerics do to not have kids? Not that I know of. I wasn't, actually, planning to go around sleeping with anyone else, knowing it bothers you, even though people here have really fantastic magic items. But I do keep a pretty sharp distinction, internally, between things I've agreed not to do and things I just definitely don't mean to— so, if you want it to be the first thing we should talk about that... Super valid, Keltham says. Not knowing any male contraception solutions for clerics seems so incredibly odd, to the point of being suspicious. Do male fourth circle clerics who don't want kids just... not have intercourse ever, except with expensive second circle wizard sex workers? Who, going on earlier things Carissa has said, maybe don't exist in the first place? Do female fourth circle clerics just not have intercourse, period? Though it does match up with an earlier statement to him that, yes, please, Chelias would like some contraception technology. Or for that matter, that they, asterisk cuff, asterisk theralarp, asterisk cuff, asterisk, didn't assign him any clerics in his research harem. I... I'm not immediately sure of where this internal resistance is coming from. Some of it is coming from a source that thinks I'm asking you to give me too much, and will then owe you something too huge, and yes, I know you already noped me on that. But that isn't making the feeling go away, and I think it's loud enough to drown out some other feeling, which means I can't just go ahead and ignore the combined feeling, and... Is this an urgent question for any reason? No, it's not. Actually, there's an even simpler solution. Until tomorrow morning... I order you to not have sex with anyone without my permission. Whatever it is my brain thinks is scary about this whole deal, it doesn't think that one day of it is scary the same way. Understood. And a good occasion for me to show you my other sex shop purchase. And she fishes it out of her bag of holding to explain. Keltham is, intrigued, but can tell that he doesn't quite understand, deep in this part of him, the shape he's looking at. But I could just order you not to do that, right? Is the magic item for people whose partners, in a relationship like this one, don't trust them? I can guess that's not it, but I'm confused. That's not it. I mean, it's dispellable, so if I actually set my mind to getting around it, I could. But some people enjoy the difference between impossible and forbidden. Like, you also don't need the chains because you could tell me to hold still— but if there are chains, then I'm not holding still because you told me to. Anymore, I'm holding still because I can't move. Different flavor. Also, I think some people experience failures of will, about obeying an order like that for weeks or months, especially if you're messing with them around it enough. So maybe they actually do have to worry about breaking a rule even though they didn't mean to. I have never tried anything like this before, so I shouldn't think too highly of myself, but I think there's no order up to, and including, stick your hand in that fire and keep it there. I'd just disobey without warning you first that it was proving too difficult. If I would, then I'm just pretending and I don't want to be just pretending. He has again that sense of being unnervingly close to some ledge on which Carissa may be trying to stabilize him, or maybe push him off. His mind retreats from the dangerous thing, tries to talk about something lesser and more trivial and safer. Oh, is this anything like the thing some women do in civilization? If they want to have a lot of sex available to trade for social capital, or collect a large harem, where they limit themselves to one actual orgasm per month, and otherwise stop short of that, 
to increase their sex drives. He forces himself to face the scary thing instead. It doesn't pay to do that all day long, but he's had relatively few shocking revelations today. I don't know whether I'm more frightened, intrigued by the notion of you wanting to make it impossible to disobey orders, or the amount by which you're trying to hand me the total keys to your sexuality, but both of those things feel like they're a step too far for me to do this minute, and I need to let it sink in for an hour without forcing it. My mind is imagining you struggling inside the chains and not being able to get out, though, and it thinks that's very sexy, much more sexy than just being chained up at all. I'm sorry. I need to hear you tell me that's okay, if, and only if that actually is okay. Obviously, I'm not asking you to send a false signal, but even after hearing you say it's fine to kill you, my brain still wants to hear you say whether or not it's okay that I'd see you struggling to get out of the chains and not let you out. It really feels like this is a situation that demands the ability to talk in metal language and say, de quote, but Carissa keeps on seeming to reject not so much that specific proposal as the entire framework of thought that would want to hear about it. Okay, push the Keltham less. I'm sorry, I don't mean to rush you to the place you'll be when you're 25. There's not actually any rush. It is definitely okay to be into me struggling in chains. It's... It is sexier, right, if the chains are actually doing something? And if I didn't happen to be into it, then I'd say it's a perfectly reasonable interest, I'm neutral on it, and you'd say, reasoning with the mysterious law above the other law, one of the other girls will be into it, and that'd be all right too, except for the part where it's very confusing. And if I happened to really dislike it, then I'd tell you, it is fine to be into that, but I dislike it. I'm frankly going to be more than slightly freaked out if I find that the girls in the harem exactly match up to every single one of my sexual desires with no leftovers. It would say some pretty unsettling things about where I am and how I got there. Uh, the reasoning that would make me worry about that is definitely below the law, to be clear. It'd be above the gods, below the math. What would it even mean to be above the law? I can't coherently imagine that. Nobody gets to decide that one plus two equals four. I notice my brain being a little tired of relationshiping, and it occurs to me that we haven't eaten breakfast and should plausibly go eat lunch or whatever's on sale. Or free, I guess, since I still haven't gotten around to having any local money. I should ask if this governance location can use a channeled healing at whatever standard rates are on that. But, I mean, we can also wrap up if you had any big important dangling issues. I'm not saying we have to go eat right now. It only occurs to Keltham, after he speaks, that he just offered Carissa options and asked her to make a decision instead of providing info to him. Is that even wrong? He doesn't know, but that section of his brain may be tired and need to rest, maybe. She seems unbothered. Lunch sounds good. I doubt you can sell healing in the palace, even in wartime, half the people here are clerics. Want me to go back to my room so you can have the afternoon to think? Above the gods, not above law. How could something be above the gods? It feels as absurd as deciding that one plus two equals four. Not sure. I'll decide after lunch. A thought occurs to him. Oh. And Carissa. Maybe I'll rethink this order later. But for now. You don't ask to be let out of the chains. You can struggle in the chains, but you can't say in words, Let me out. I won't flip out if you slip up and say it once, but if you keep on saying it, you'll be disobeying me. Same if I hurt you. You can tell me it's painful, you can advise me that a more experienced sadist in my position would probably stop, but you don't tell me to stop or argue that I should stop. If I'm doing something to you that's going to break your ability to obey that order, let me know when you see it coming. Understood? She is not sure where he's going with that, but I understand and a smile because she's trying to reward steps in the right direction, and that seems like one. Keltham doesn't smile back. One conceals feelings, perhaps, but showing a smile you don't mean is quite a step beyond that. It destroys the ability to signal later, because how can anything mean anything after that? Good, is all he says. Keltham isn't at all clear on his own ability to ignore somebody asking to be let out of chains. 
he doesn't particularly want to test it while he's still such a novice. And more importantly, if Carissa Savar does start telling him that he needs to let her out right now, Keltham will know that something broke her, will to obey him, and that something is wrong with the entire setup. Maybe it's cheating to set up a secret completely legible meta-signal of meta-level failure, but then, cheating is technique after all. Then let's go eat lunch, Keltham says. They get all the way as far as halfway to a small eating hall before Keltham notices a lingering confusion. Though to be clear, they do continue walking towards lunch past this point. Anne starts asking why a single use of alter self doesn't render women permanently sterile if it destroys their limited supply of eggs that have no analog uterus to carry them in male form, and why an implanted embryo would be destroyed by alter self if the eggs weren't destroyed, and why men aren't rendered sterile by alter self during the week, or whatever that duration was, that's required to mature new sperm if the current sperm maturing in the epididymis get destroyed. And actually, maybe they should try this with food coloring, if that's a thing here, to see if that vanishes permanently from a vagina that temporarily doesn't exist. Rather than having sex, that's potentially a security premise violation if the whole method proves not to work the very first time it's tested. Good luck, Carissa Sever. A Dathilani woman in your position would know exactly how this masculine gender trope works, but you don't. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash AI. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.